Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending AACP's webinar with Dr. Peter Vitrek, presenting the myths and physics of soft tissue surgical dental lasers. I'm Shaylin, the Association Manager for the AACP, and I will be the host of the webinar tonight. The host has no conflicts of interest. I would also like to mention some upcoming events for the AACP. Our next complimentary webinar will be May 11th with Dr. Whit Wilkerson on creating healthier patients and practices, integrative dental medicine. Also on May 20th through 21st in Fort Worth, Dallas, the AACP is hosting a two-day dual conference featuring fundamentals of TMJ and sleep for the new doctor and staff, as well as an injection one traditional concepts course. Lastly, the CBD crash course for healthcare professionals with Dr. Gregory Smith is scheduled for June 4th. I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Peter Vitrek. Dr. Vitrek was born and raised in Ukraine. He earned his PhD degree in physics from the Moscow Physics and Technology Institute. In the 1990s, he held a research scientist position with the Academy of Sciences in the former USSR and then a Royal Society Visiting Research Fellow position at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, Scotland, UK. In 2002, Dr. Vitrick founded LuxCare LLC, an exclusive certified Luxor laser service and accessories provider. In 2005, he founded Auslight LLC and Light Scalpel LLC the only American-based designer and manufacturer of surgical CO2 lasers for the small office outpatient market. Dr. Vitrick has authored 10 patents and over 20 articles on CO2 lasers and is a member of the Institute of Physics UK. In 2017, he founded the American Laser Study Club, an educational platform that helps physicians, dentists, veterinarians and practice staff members to excel at efficient and safe application of laser energy in everyday practice. He is married to his wife of 37 years, Natasha, and together they have two children, Olga and Alexander. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Vitruck. So thank you again. Thank you, Shailen. Thank you, the AACP for this opportunity to uh, share some of the laser tissue interaction nuances with respect to the soft tissue lasers. And since there is a quite a bit of the misconceptions out there that were told to the profession of dentistry over the past 20, 30 years, so that's why the title has the, 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 the miss in it. So we'll go very briefly through that and then we'll dive into the how exactly the laser light interacts with the soft tissue and specifically for the surgical applications. So that's the title. And we're going to talk about the, how exactly, how deep do laser beams cut and how deep do, do they coagulate on the surgical margins. The disclosures. So wearing two hats today. Uh, founder of the American Laser Study Club and also a couple of the laser companies. This is what I used to do for a living, developing the, it's essentially the CO2 laser resonator technologies. And they published a couple of the articles, the review articles on the laser tissue interaction for the soft tissue laser surgeries. This is the one published in Dental Town 2017. Pretty much a version of that was published also as the position paper uh, for the dental lasers by the American Board of Laser Surgery. And the, we hopefully a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months away from uh, Dental Association publishing the position paper on dental lasers with the contribution that I was honored to, to make. All right. so. It's from the get-go, uh, kind of diving into the topic of the of this presentation, we have a pretty simple question as to what exactly makes 
a laser being appropriate for this uh, for the soft tissue surgeries. So the, uh, the answer has two answers to it. First, the laser beam needs to be able to vaporize or uh, abate the soft tissue or cut, excise, incise. And if the laser beam is not capable of vaporizing or ablating the soft tissue, then we're not even talking about the, about the laser surgery. So that's the first requirement. But then what exactly makes uh, this laser or any laser better than the scalpel or you know the pair of scissors? And the answer is we need to have the hemostasis and coagulation on the surgical margins. Pretty simple, but it's important to spell it out. What exactly makes this particular tool appropriate for the uh, soft tissue surgeries? Ability to vaporize the soft tissue and ability to uh, create the hemostasis and coagulation on the surgical margins. And rephrase uh, this question and these statements this way. So you are one on one with the with your patients. You know you have your uh, you you have your laser handpiece in your hands. You step on the foot switch. So here comes this very critical question: How deep do we cut? Are we cutting all the way through the skull of the patient? And, and then if we are succeeding in cutting, and hopefully that's the controlled depth of cuts, then how deep do we coagulate on the surgical margins? Do we coagulate, do we fry the soft tissue all the way to the bone? Or what is it? So this is something that we're going to address in the next half hour. And hopefully, this will be a, a pretty simple black and white uh, picture as to how deep do we cut and how deep do we coagulate in the surgical margins. I have a perfect example of the surgical laser in action. So this is going to be the phrenectomy video. And the uh, once, so th this is just a good il illustration of what, uh, what I, I am planning to discuss in the next half hour. So let, let's 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 watch the video. So what you saw in this video, you saw uh, the incision and then release uh, of this uh, tongue tie with the instant hemostasis. And the, this translucent tissue right below the, uh, the hand piece was the dehydrated tissue and also the coagulated mucosa. And the part of the uh, kind of the, the part of how all this works. And you were able to see this laser incision and release in action was due to the you you did have the unobstructed view of the surgical site. You saw the mucosa before the release. Once you started seeing the release, you saw the fascia below it, and you didn't see the, the drop of blood. And the, the depth of the incision was just enough to go through the mucosa, and we barely started going to, into the fascia. And that was the clinical decision by, uh, by the surgeon, Dr. Baxter, not to go too deep into the fascia. So this, this is exactly what I mean by the, how do we control the depth of the incision and the, and the depth of the coagulation is kind of uh, the part of the, how the laser beam was interacting with the laser tissue. And we will understand in the next 10, 15 minutes as to what exactly was uh, the depth of the incision. So understanding uh, that this is, in my view, this is one of the appropriate and the best wavelengths and the laser beam formats for the soft tissue oral surgeries. So once we understand that, then just want to illustrate you know, the personal experience. This is my grandbaby son, Leonard, 
and at the age of two weeks, he absolutely needed to have his um, oral restrictions taken care of. So uh, tongue tie, lip tie, before and after pictures, and just like in the Dr. Baxter video, there was just a seconds per sight, no bleeding, uh, no discomfort, no painkillers required the next day or even the same night after the surgery. This is the wonderful team at the Health Latch here in Seattle, Dr. Thomas and Dr. Gormley. And this is my uh, grandbaby uh, son drunk on milk the same night, the same day after the, after the surgery. This is the Thanksgiving last year. All right, so with this introduction, uh, the, uh, I, want to sh I want to share a couple of the misconceptions as far as the lasers go, and the, uh, there is no better way to start than just a Hollywood idea what the lasers do. There is about one day long lecture why this is not possible, but made a good, good, good movie back in the 60s. Death rays shooting from space. The only good thing about that was that the, the Soviet Union uh, got our own idea about this whole concept of lasers from space, and that pretty much <clears throat> run down the economy. Uh, James Bond uh, laser shooting from the from the watch. And now we're getting closer to uh, the topic uh, of uh, this presentation: laser phrenectomy. If anybody believes that the laser beam out of the glass fiber. We're talking about the, uh, the diode laser. If the diode laser light, if anybody believes that the diode laser light can vaporize uh, the soft tissue, that this patient is in a world of pain and hurt. And uh, to further illustrate this point, this is the screenshot uh, from the television program aired in Australia, that was about two years ago, three years ago. So what we are watching here is the, it's a diode hot tip phrenectomy, uh, where we're literally frying the patient to the bone. <clears throat> so if we understand the hot tip, then try to figure out where the blood is coming from. That's the same patient, uh, the screenshot, seconds apart. Uh, so neither of these pictures have anything to do with the laser surgery. This was the hot tip phrenectomy. And then apparently something went wrong uh, when we did have so much bleeding. And hopefully within uh, 20 minutes, we will understand uh, how exactly both are still possible within uh, the same the same procedure for uh, the same treatment for the same patient. All right, so since we stated that the kind of the laser that we want to have for the soft tissue surgeries is the one that can ablate or vaporize or cut the tissue, and at the same time, it can coagulate uh, on the surgical margins, we just instantly have to recognize that there are some types of lasers out there that cannot cut or ablate the tissue and or cannot coagulate on the surgical margins. So we should be able to create a pretty simple quadrant of all of the medical lasers out there with respect to their ability uh, to cut and coagulate uh, on the surgical margins. Uh, top right corner, the type of the laser that's appropriate for the vascular uh, soft tissue surgeries, cutting and coagulating at the same time. Uh, bottom right corner, we are cutting, but we are not coagulating. Examples are the LASIK surgery or the heart tissue surgery. So for the LASIK surgery, when we are vaporizing or incising through cornea, is there, is there anything to coagulate in the cornea? Absolutely not. Same with the heart tissue laser. Is there anything to coagulate in, uh, in enamel or dentin? Absolutely not. 
uh, top left corner, the uh, great coagulative uh, properties of the laser tissue the interaction, but no vaporization of the tissue. Great many applications in a cosmetic uh, laser surgery, and also some in dentistry, like the hemangioma treatment. And the bottom right is the perfect example for the photobiomodulation. So on the right hand side of this chart, we have the ablative lasers and the left hand side, we have a non-ablative lasers. So at this point, if we, if, we, if, if we kind of simply recognize there are the ablative lasers and the non-ablative lasers, we are at least at a 50 percentile of understanding the soft tissue laser surgery, ablative lasers and non-ablative lasers, very different applications. So uh, then how exactly laser wavelength fits into the, the different properties of how the laser light interacts with the tissue? So very quick note about the laser wavelength. All you have to think is just the color of the light. On the right-hand side, the red colors in the visible range, that's the 700 nanometers, the, the extreme uh, red colors of the light. On the, on the left-hand side, the, the blue, the violet colors, 400 nanometers. So why does that matter? Well, believe it or not, uh, almost all of them uh, dental lasers, at least for the soft tissue applications, they can be divided into the three, in, into the simple three categories. One micrometer, three micrometer, and 10 micrometer class lasers, different uh, units of measure, 1,000, 3,000, 10,000 nanometers. So why is that important? Why do I spend even time on this? So I have a two videos to share. So one of them is the, so this is going to be the, the laser beam out of the CO2 laser, uh, classical uh, CO2 laser 10.6 micrometers. The target is the muscle tissue. Uh, it's, a, it's just a poultry uh, from the grocery store, chicken leg. Uh, the important uh, things to watch here are the, are the exact numbers. What is the power and what is the spot size of the laser beam? The spot size, think of it simply as how sharp is your laser knife. So in this particular case, it's a pretty sharp, very small spot size on the quarter uh, millimeter in diameter. So let's watch the video. So what you see here, you see the instant incision, and you can say, Peter, you're wasting our time. Every child knows what lasers do. That's what they do, they cut. Well, next video, same tissue, same power, same spot size. We just changed the wavelength. So let's see what's going to happen. And the absolutely no incision. This tissue could care less about this expensive $10,000 laser beam. As you can see, there is absolutely no cutting. So the summary here is that there is something extremely profound about the laser wavelength. So, so the next couple of um, uh, slides and couple of minutes is going to go over the, how exactly the color of the light or the wavelength affects interacts with the tissue and not just any tissue, but here we go, water. Why water? 80, at least 80% 80 of the uh, soft tissue is actually histological water. So if we don't understand how the laser light interacts with histological water, there is absolutely nothing to discuss about the laser surgery. You know, we might as well all go home. So let's try to understand what's happening with the laser light interacting with the water. And the, the single most important set of data uh, helping to understand uh, the, the laser surgery is a so-called absorption spectrum. 
On a horizontal axis, we have the wavelength for the color of the light. That's why it's called spectrum. On a vertical axis, we have the absorption coefficient, or you can think of it as the absorption strength. How strongly the light is absorbed by the tissue as it goes through the tissue. Horizontal axis is logarithmic, which is super important. So if you look at the very bottom of the vertical scale, and then you go uh, up, you have the, hopefully you can see my mouse as I'm moving it up. So the, the changes are very profound as you're moving from top, uh, from bottom to top. So why am I showing it? Here's why. So if you look at the, the strength of the absorption in the visible range of the wavelengths, the rainbow colors here, you look at the horizontal axis, these numbers are extremely low which is, so let me also mention that the lower those numbers, the longer the light can go through the tissue. So the low absorption coefficient for the visible range of the colors means that the light can go through water for the very, very long distances, which is the reason why the water in the glass is transparent. When, it, when the light and the visible uh, range of the wavelengths is going through water, three, four, five, ten 10 inches of depth, there is almost no absorption at those wavelengths. So we perceive uh, the water as transparent. So then we look at this small, at the, at the dip uh, in the absorption spectrum. Uh, so one thing we can say about uh, these uh, wavelengths and these colors of the light that you cannot find any other colors of the light that have weaker absorption or the, the colors that go through the water for the longest distances, which is why the world underwater looks blue. All the other colors are filtered out. So, so far, I present this to you that all of you already know from your life experiences, from some of them, high school physics uh, classes. So, so far, we can understand how the optical properties of water, at least in the visible range, translates to what we see around us. Very weak abs absorption means the light travels for the long distances. <clears throat> so now if we were to choose the infrared color of the light, which is a diode laser, definitely a longer wavelength and greater absorption, but still not too much greater absorption coefficient. So let's see, let's see what's going to happen. And the, this droplet of water just does not care about the $10,000 laser beam, as you can see. So that's the point about the diode lasers not really having much of the impact on the most dominant component of the soft tissue, histological water. So let's change the wavelength. We're changing it to 10,000 nanometers or 10 micrometers. So this is going to be the 10, there's going to be the CO2 laser. And the, let's see what's going in this video. And the, so what we see is the very efficient vaporization of water. So right here, we, we, we kind of at the 90 percentile mark of understanding the soft tissue surgery. We are vaporizing histological water. So a few more slides that are going to go after uh, some other components. Uh, of the soft tissue, melanin, hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin. And so the important note is for the purpose of this presentation, we don't really care about the melanin. Melanin resides in the epithelium, but if we are performing phrenectomy, we are going through mucosa. So yeah, we, we had to go through the epithelium for the you know, 
split nanosecond, and then we are working in mucosa. There is no melanin in mucosa. So forget about the melanin. So we are looking at the, the absorption spectrum of the histological water and the uh, uh, histologically relevant presence of the hemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. Now we're able to put all of the uh, commercial laser wavelengths on this map. So all of the diodes belong into uh, this range around 1,000 nanometers. And the absorption strength is still extremely low. Uh, with hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin or without it is very low. So now we're switching to the CO2 laser wavelengths, both the classical 10.6 and the newer 9.3. And here comes that eureka moment, ballpark 1,000 times stronger absorption strength for the CO2 laser wavelength relative to the diode laser uh, wavelength, which explains uh, why the CO2 lasers are in the class of the ablative lasers. So there's another class of the laser wavelength, which is the erbium laser. On average, it's about 10 times more efficient uh, for vaporizing water, just because it's the 10 times stronger absorbed by histological water. So, so here's the summary, ablative and non-ablative lasers. Uh, the, the separation is based on the, the strength of the absorption of the light by the, uh, by the soft tissue. So we didn't mention anything yet about the coagulation, but at least with respect to vaporization, Erbium laser is the most efficient. Diode lasers are the least efficient, and the CO2 laser somewhere in between. Right. So here's the great example of the CO2 laser simulated uh, vestibuloplasty. Very efficient, and the very uh, uneventful. You just point and shoot, and so you have the incision. Uh, with the diode laser with the tissue clean, glass tip. We still don't see much of them. Very boring video if uh, shown to physicians or even veterinarians, uh, those who use the laser, the, the surgical lasers. But it's kind of shocking for, uh, for dentists who uh, might be confused as to why exactly, you know, the most popular soft tissue dental laser is not capable to cut the soft tissue and the explanation is coming up in about three to five minutes so so what you just saw there was no cutting no ablation with the diode laser wavelength in the infrared range around 1000 nanometers so now let's try to uh, facilitate some kind of the interaction of the diode laser wavelength with the tissue, with the soft tissue. And the way to do so is to increase the hemoglobin concentration. And stay. so this is the fresh cow liver and still absolutely no action at all. Uh, hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin rich uh, soft tissue and still we are not cutting. Uh, and now here's the trick. So this is right now, there is the introduction of the concept of the laser fluence. And the, so the fluence is, uh, and we will use this concept in about 15 minutes from now to explain how deep lasers cut. So the fluence is simply the laser power times uh, the duration of the time that the laser beam is shooting at the target divided by the footprint area of the laser beam. So power times time divided by the footprint. The easiest way to increase the fluence is simply hold the laser beam stationary on the tissue. So the time is going through the roof. So we are not moving fast, we're just staying on, 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 on that one spot. 
And so let's see what's going to happen if we were to uh, maximize the fluence, which is we are not moving the beam. So what you see, you see the searing of the tissue. This is the white discoloration spreading sideways. And then you saw the spark. What was, the, what was that flash? We were burning hemoglobin. So did we succeed in creating a little dimple? In, 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 did we succeed in vaporizing the soft tissue? Absolutely, yes. But can anybody call this surgery? Hell no. So that was just a sheer torture for the patient with the massive thermal damage, collateral thermal damage. So we changed the wavelength, very much the same thing is happening here. So with the, with the non-ablative laser wavelength, uh, the uh, laser tissue interaction uh, can result in some significant uh, thermal damage and very limited vaporization of the tissue. And stay, uh, uh, I am not that smart to figure this all out on my own. This is the paper published about 22 years ago by neurosurgeons. And stay, if anybody's interested, I have the handout uh, for this lecture so you can just read the direct quote. And the, the whole point here was that the, the best way to use the, the, the near infrared laser light for the soft tissue surgeries is actually not to use the light directly on a tissue, but rather use the light to heat up the glass tip and then use the hot glass tip to perform the hot tip surgery. So, and that's kind of the brief introduction into how exactly the dental diets work. They, they are the hot tip devices. And so here's the, here's the interview to Howard uh, Ferran did with uh, Gordon Christensen that explains uh, excellently how exactly the, the most popular soft tissue dental laser meaning the diet laser works. What, what, what's your views on lasers? This particular uh, orientation of diode is basically uh, in the 800, 900 nanometer range. And it, uh, it basically uh, is light going through it that wavelength through a fiber optic bundle and the light will do nothing, nothing until you put, as you know, a black piece of burnt cork or, or articulating uh, color on the tip. So if you send light through this fiber optic bundle and it hits this black thing, what would it turn to? Heat. Uh, the diode laser is basically a large electrosurgery, a slow large electrosurgery, making a cut, give or take three quarters of a millimeter to a millimeter wide. Um, I yeah, so that's a, in essence, you know, the three minutes Two minutes explanation really uh, gets uh, the the essence of how the hot hot uh, tip uh, cautery works. Even though it is powered not by the el electrical current, but powered by the uh, more expensive uh, laser light. And so I promise that there will be some of the misconceptions. Uh, uh, shown so this is the so if you were to look at some of the textbooks out there uh, like this one both editions you will not find a single reference to the near infrared diode laser wavelengths being the non-ablator ones you will not find a single word about the charred hot glass tips and the, so uh, hopefully in a short period of time available. There is a simple understanding how exactly the, uh, the near infrared dental diet lasers work, hot tip cautery devices. Okay, so moving on from here and jumping now into the, how exactly a laser light coagulates the tissue. Uh, so the same video, of the CO2 laser, and just please watch the margins of that incision, a different color. So this, this, what happens on those surgical margins is exactly 
the topic of this next uh, three, uh, four minute segment coagulation. So they as the laser light vaporizes the tissue. So I'm showing the laser beam moving from the left hand side uh, into the right hand side and right at the interface, uh, right at the surface of the tissue, the intensity of light is at its highest. So this is where the ablation or the vaporization is possible. And I'm illustrating it with the, uh, this red color of the tissue that is vaporized or ablated by the laser beam. But right below the uh, vaporization margin, we still have the, the soft tissue present and the intensity is much, much lower. It's not enough to vaporize, but still enough to uh, uh, coagulate or heat up the tissue. And the, the weaker the absorption, the longer distance this tail can penetrate into the tissue. The stronger the absorption, the, the, the shorter, the shallower penetration uh, of the beam of the laser intensity is into the tissue. So now if you simply look at the blood vessel diameter, you can instantly recognize that depending on the wavelength, depending on how deep the laser light can penetrate into the tissue and the surgical margins, we can or cannot vapor, uh, coagulate the blood vessels uh, efficiently enough coagulation depth. So now if uh, we were to uh, now look at the uh, blood vessel geometry, which is just, just a pipe, uh, it has the, a certain thickness uh, to its wall and also the, the, a certain uh, uh, finite diameter uh, for, for the blood vessels. And for, from, the, from the cadaver studies, so capillaries for human gingiva, they vary between 20 to 40 micrometers. So if you were to take a knife and puncture the wall of the blood vessel, we're going to see the bleeding of the liquid blood through the wall, through the hole in that wall. There is no mechanism here to stop the bleeding. So if we were to now take the laser beam which has a very strong absorption in the soft tissue. And if we are able to puncture the wall and laser beam does not penetrate inside the blood vessel, so there is no mechanism here to keep uh, the blood from leaking through uh, the hole in, 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 in the wall. So we have a bleeding situation. Uh, and that's pretty much what happens with the airbeam laser wavelengths. Another extreme, we take the uh, near infrared laser wavelengths. We have a pretty uh, long penetration of the laser beam into the soft tissue. So we are capable to, vape, uh, to coagulate multiple blood vessels. However, we already know that this is the non-ablative uh, laser wavelengths. So then it kind of naturally prepares us to uh, expect there has to be some kind of the golden medium where the, the depth of the absorption is not uh, too shallow and not too extensive. So we are able to both vaporize and coagulate on the scale of the blood vessel diameters. And that would be the ideal laser wavelength for the vascular soft tissue surgery with the blood vessels of uh, having the diameters, kind of the ballpark, the depth of the absorption uh, of the laser light in this tissue. So the same thing as a chart. This is the chart of the, uh, this is the coagulation depth spectrum. The red band here is the, uh, the blood vessel uh, capillary diameters, 20 to 40 micrometers, airbeam lasers. Do they coagulate? Absolutely, yes. 
but they just don't coagulate deep enough, which is the reason why you will not find erbium lasers in vascular soft tissue surgery outside of the dentistry. So looking at the near infrared diet lasers, great coagulators, and then we have the CO2 lasers, both the classical and the newer wavelength. And here's that, uh, you can call it a eureka moment, an explanation why uh, the CO2 laser surgery on a vascular tissue is so uneventfully efficient and bloodless. The depth of the coagulation is just a two, three times the diameters of the blood uh, vessel uh, uh, capillaries. So now if we were to look at the, so the next couple of slides, they kind of, let me just go into kind of the rapid fire here. The whole point here is that the, if we can use the, the, the long pulse lasers, we can extend the depth of the coagulation simply by allowing the heat from the irradiated tissue to escape into the deeper uh, uh, into the deeper tissue. Okay, so uh, at this point, let me just summarize uh, summarize that the just understanding the absorption properties uh, of the light in the soft tissue we can have a pretty good understanding what makes uh, uh, the, the difference between the ablative and non-ablative lasers. The lasers with the strongest absorption, they are the ablative lasers, CO2 lasers and the erbium lasers. And then if we were to look into the coagulative properties, then the, the lasers with the too strong absorption, uh, in the soft tissue, then don't they do not make a good coagulators because they penetrate just simply too shallow into the tissue. So understanding the impact of the wavelength on the ability to vaporize the tissue or not, and the the impact on how deep we can, we can coagulate, uh, that can explain the why. The, the air beam lasers are the best cutting lasers and the diode lasers are the, the least effective lasers for cutting the soft tissue and the CO2 lasers are kind of somewhere in between. Looking at the coagulative properties, the CO2 laser is the one that can get you both cutting and coagulation at the same time, which explains why the, the CO2 laser is the laser of choice uh, not just in soft tissue dentistry, but also outside of the dentistry in all of the vascular soft tissue procedures. You can vaporize efficiently and still have just enough coagulation on the surgical margins. But, but now I did not say anything yet about the how deep are we cutting. So this next couple of minutes will be all about the depth of the incision. So regardless of the target of the, for, for the laser beams, the depth of the vaporization or the depth of the ablation, depth of the cut is all about the fluence. I briefly mentioned the fluence concept about 20 minutes ago. And so here's the same thing now spelled out power times time that the laser beam is shooting at the target divided by the area of the laser beam footprint or the spot size to the power of two. And I have a couple of videos that illustrate this concept and I will, uh, the first videos will show how laser power impacts the depth of the vaporization. I'm using uh, the Dr. Robert Strauss modified protocols. Uh, these are the videos uh, of the how deep the laser beams cut on acrylic blocks. Strauss is on the left. In the middle is the inventor of the CO2 lasers. And so again, so this is the a simple formula. 
power times time divided by the sports, the sport size to the power of two. And then, so this is the very critical in understanding how exactly you control the laser beam and the depth uh, of the incision that you are making. Power times time divided by the area of the spot size. So uh, here's the first video. Uh, this is the power and the, the video. It's kind of very self-explanatory, no, no need for too many words here. So now let's double the power. And what we see, we double the depth. Three, three times the power, ballpark, three times the depth of the incision. So far, so good. So now let's test the impact of the uh, duration of the uh, time that the laser beam is shooting at the targets. And what do we see? Uh, that's the depth with the 500 milliseconds. Now for the shorter pulse, we are cutting not as deep and you get the idea. The shorter the pulse duration, the shallower the incision. Yep, so far so good. Uh, the video just illustrates the whole concept of the power times time divided by the area. So now is probably one of the most important videos in this presentation. Uh, so this is where we will try to cut uh, to the same depth, but using different geometries of the beams, laser beams. So we will start with a very large uh, diameter of the beam. So think of it as the doll knife. So let's watch the video and it's a very long pulse. So let's watch the video. And what we see is that they, we wanted to incise uh, to, the, to this depth. And there, there seem to be a lot of the collateral damage uh, sidewise. So now let's reduce the spot size in half. So the area is the four times smaller. So ballpark, we have a four times shorter uh, duration of the pulse. So we just inflicted the same depth of the incision, but the patient experienced the laser beam for the four times shorter duration of time. And as you can see, there is so much less collateral damage spatially, sidewise. So now, if we were to choose even smaller uh, spot size, so this diameter has about 10 times less area of the laser beam. So we're choosing the 10 times shorter pulse. And let's see if we can produce the same depth of the incision. And what do we see? Boom. So you can imagine how much less collateral damage is done to the patient and for how much uh, shorter uh, the procedure can be if you're just choosing uh, the, the proper fluence with the, small, the smallest possible diameter of the laser beam. So, but how all this actually uh, translates into the surgical, the practical situation because now you have the moving laser beam. So let's look at this formula again, power times time divided by the area. I rewrite it as this way, uh, spot size times the spot size. And so the ratio of the spot size uh, divided by the time that the laser beam is shooting at the target, that's your hand speed. So I can rewrite this thing in this way, the depth of the incision, is proportional to the power divided by the spot size and the hand speed. And so now comes the most important kind of outcome from, from this presentation, how exactly you control uh, the depth of your incision, be it a phrenectomy, a perculectomy, gingivectomy, you name it, skin, re uh, skin resurfacing. So who controls the power? Well, you do, you put, whatever the number you want on a control panel, but does not change during your uh, incision or excision. Now, who controls the spot size? Well, that's the hand, the hand piece. You are not switching between different hand pieces uh, during 
the single incision. And here comes the most important parameter, hand speed. Who controls the hand speed? You do. So, so, so how much simpler the laser surgery can be than you practicing the steady hand speed? So let's illustrate the hands, the impact of the hand speed on the depth of the incision. Acrylic block again, about one and a half seconds was the duration of this incision. Now let's slow down the hand speed. Let's time it about uh, twice as long it took us to do this incision. And, the, and that's uh, the, the illustration of the, the, the formula for the depth of the incision. The slower you go, the deeper you cut. And the, so illustration on a tissue sample, uh, the hairline incision, the, the width is approximately 200 micrometers and now faster hand speed. And it's a very, very superficial vaporization of the tissue. The faster you go, the more superficial, the shallower the incision is. So in very practical terms, just practice steady hand speed. This is how you get your repeatable and reproducible uh, results. They are practicing the hand speed. I'm gonna just mention that the so if if you think about the the presets or so-called presets, say for phrenectomies, the whole point here is that there is no such a thing as a preset. It all depends on your personal preference for your hand speed. If you naturally always want to go fast, your power is gonna go up. If you prefer to work very slow with your incisions, you will be using the lower power. So this is why for phrenectomies, uh, the power settings, they vary from approximately half a watt to about two and a, two and a half watts five times the difference. And in the very beginning, I showed you Dr. Baxter, uh, three seconds phrenectomy, the secret behind the scenes, Dr. Baxter likes using the higher power. So he is naturally is going to go fast and efficient with his, um, uh, with his phrenectomies. For those of you who are using lower powers, whatever the reasons, you will never go as uh, short, like a three, five seconds is going to take longer uh, just because you are not incising as deep uh, per each uh, path. So with this, this is the summary uh, from this presentation in a grand scheme of things, lasers are not lasers, are not lasers, are not lasers. They're different one depending on the wavelength. So in a grand scheme of things, Think about just the two big classes, ablative and the non-ablative lasers. The one uh, type that is appropriate for the soft tissue surgery, it has to cut and coagulate at the same time. The depth of the coagulation depends on pulsing. The shorter the pulse, the shallower coagulation. The longer the pulse, the deeper coagulation. You are allowing the, the heat from the irradiated uh, tissue to escape into the deeper layers. And the, um, as far as the depth of the incision with laser beams, it's all about the ratio of the power and the hand speed. And the, uh, actually let's go very fast through that. So this is the, uh, the end of it and the, uh, I thank you for your time and patience with me. If any questions, I will be super happy to, to answer them. Thank you so much, Dr. Vitrek. Uh, it does look like we have one question. How has the use of lasers impacted post-op visits due to complications? Okay, thank you, great question. So be, be patient with me when, I, when, I, when I'm answering it. So everybody knows about the, how great the laser surgery can be. So think about the skin resurfacing, right? Uh, so there is, the lasers have the reputation 
uh, for the very uneventful healing with the get great postoperative results, no scarring and all of that. But that comes only if you are using a proper laser. <laughs> Imagine you are using the wrong laser for the LASIK procedure. You're going to make that patient blind. So no difference in the oral soft tissues. If you are using the laser that has too deep coagulation, you just got yourself a burn victim. The healing is going to be hell, right? So now another extreme, if you have the uh, laser with too shallow depth of the coagulation, so then there is no difference between your $100,000 laser and the $10 knife. You're just not getting coagulation. Now, but if you are using a proper laser with just enough coagulation, then bingo, all of a sudden magic shows up. Uh, so when you read the papers and hear about the laser surgery, laser this and laser that, it's, it's always important to, uh, in my mind, and especially when I was choosing which exactly laser was going to be used on my grandbaby son, right? And it was not the hot tip, and it was not the $100,000 equivalent of the $10 knife. It was the soft tissue, the, the probably the best soft tissue CO2 laser that was getting both at the same time. Fast incision, instant coagulation, not too extensive, which minimizes the post-operative uh, complications. So. Uh, so hopefully this is enough of the explanation that the, if you are using the proper laser wavelength, which gets you just enough depth of the coagulation. So think of the depth of the coagulation as this artificial epithelium. So you created just enough kind of the biofilm uh, to, to cover the tissue then you can hope for them. You can actually get the good post-op results. But if you are using the wrong wavelength and you actually getting yourself a burn victim or you're getting the, the, the post-operatively, the patient with the open wound because there was not enough the coagulation, those are not the extremes that you want to think about the proper uh, laser surgery, proper laser uh, post-operative healing, proper laser post-operative pain experience. Great. Thank you so much. It looks like that is all of our questions. So with that, thank you again, Dr. Vitrick, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Thanks thank so you much. so much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.